My name is Raul Stjanstvianov, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And today I'll be talking about our work on enabling end-to-end -end encryption for container, <coughs> for container checkpointing in Kubernetes. Um, container checkpointing is fundamental technology that is used for many different use cases. And some examples are fault tolerance, where a checkpoint is created periodically for long running applications, and in the case of failure, the application can be restored from the last checkpoint, or fast application startup, where checkpoint can be created after the application has initialized some state, and then the application can be started at this um, in, in, in an already initialized state, or preemptive scheduling, where um, low priority tasks are preempted so that high priority tasks can be scheduled in clusters and load balancing where um, applications can be migrated between different nodes in a cluster to improve root utilization or forensic analysis uh, where a checkpoint is created and can be analyzed later on to inspect the runtime state, for example, uh, at particular time, for example, during a cyber attack. And um, uh, these checkpoint restore mechanisms are usually integrated in, in large systems uh, like container platforms or um, Google's Borg Engine or Microsoft Singularity. And um, by default, they don't provide uh, encryption capabilities. And this is important because um, users have to implement their own security mechanisms. Um, and essentially enable the encryption within the larger system. And there are two common approaches for solving this problem. The first one is local encryption, where the checkpoint is stored in a local storage, and then it's encrypted and transferred to a distributed storage, or streaming, where um, you, uh, the data is transferred over file descriptors with Unix sockets to an external tool that performs the encryption and transfers the data to remote storage. Um, the, the problem with this, um, with the first approach, is that it has additional um, read-write operations, so it requires additional storage to save the checkpoint, and this could be hundreds of gigabytes in memory state, um, and also, um, an attacker could potentially access the local storage and uh, access the data during the checkpoint. Um, the streaming encryption is also difficult to integrate with um, existing container checkpoint encryption um, because it relies on communication over uh, un unauthenticated communication over Unix socket, and um, essentially. Both of these mechanisms don't support advanced optimization techniques, such as um, iterative checkpointing or memory data application, uh, which require understanding of what is the data structure of the checkpoint. Uh, the restore mechanism uh, also works in a similar way. So the data is transferred from the remote storage to local storage and decrypted and then provided to the encryption tool. And, um, Storing uh, unencrypted checkpoint data can introduce um, significant security risks. First, uh, the checkpoint itself contains a snapshot of the application memory. This includes um, passwords, tokens, and pretty much everything that the application can store in memory. And ac having access to this data allows, for example, to perform ses session hijacking or um, modifying the checkpoint could allow an attacker to insert malicious code and create a backdoor in the application, um, or modify the control flow of the application and, for example, um, bypass authentication. Um, some of the challenges with enabling checkpointing is um, performance optimization in, in a sense that if you have hundreds of gigabytes of memory state, um, Encrypting and decrypting this data adds additional overhead to the checkpointing process. And authentication in multi-tenant clusters can be challenging. It requires uh, different users to use different keys. Integrating this with, uh, with the checkpointing engine requires uh, key management. And uh, verifying the integrity and 
functionality of checkpoint data is also essential to verify that um, the checkpoint hasn't been modified. Um, so iterative checkpointing is optimization technique that's commonly used for use cases such as live migration. Um, this is when uh, you want to transfer um, a running container from one node to another node without stopping the container. And it usually consists of several iterations where um, we create a snapshot of the application's memory. We transfer um, this snapshot, and while we are transferring the, uh, the data, we keep track of what memory pages are changing uh, while the application is running. And then we transfer only the modified memory pages. And we repeat this process several times until either a threshold has been reached or the memory state is small enough that um, we can stop the application and transfer the rest of the state and um, resume the application on the destination node. And the problem is when we introduce encryption, this adds additional overhead on the uh, source and destination side where we have to encrypt and decrypt the data. <laughs> and um, with live migration, uh, performance is very important because um, essentially this process, this iteration process depends on how quickly the application trans uh, modifies memory pages. For example, if memory pages are modified faster, then they can be tra transferred to the destination site, then uh, this iteration process is infinite. Um, another uh, use case for iterative checkpointing is, for example, with fault tolerance, where we, um, for example, in, um, um, in scientific computing, there are um, many computations that take a long time to complete, uh, sometimes weeks or months, and it's very important to um, periodically save the state of these applications. Um, so iterative checkpointing here allows to um, essentially keep track of what state has changed and um, create a checkpoint where we save only the um, modified memory pages. And in, in the checkpointing engine, Creo, essentially we uh, use the soft 30 bit in the Linux kernel to um, keep track of what um, pages have changed. And then we create a link to a previous checkpoint um, that allows to essentially restore the process in reverse. Um, the problem is when the checkpoints are encrypted, then we have several cycles where we have to decrypt the previous checkpoints to identify uh, what memory pages are available. Um, and this adds additional overhead. And memory, de memory deduplication is another technique that is used with iterative checkpointing where um, memory pages in previous checkpoints can be deallocated using a system call called fallocate, or essentially creating, uh, it's called punching holes in the file or creating sparse file. So essentially, um, it allows to, to reduce the size of the checkpoint. However, um, this is also challenging when encryption is used because essentially we not only have to decrypt the date, but now we have to modify the previous checkpoint and encrypt it back. So um, it increases the uh, performance overhead. And to solve these problems, we are um, proposing a built-in encryption mechanism in Creo. So essentially we are uh, modifying the checkpointing engine to um, encrypt the data as it is being checkpointed. Um, and this builds on the existing support for TOS, which is used with component called page server. A page server is used for live migrating memory pages from one node to another, and it uses the GNU TOS uh, library. So essentially we're using the same um, public key infrastructure for TOS and using the cryptographic primitives from the GNU TOS library to extend um, this to to extend the, um, to add additional functionality that encrypts all images that the checkpointing engine Creo creates. Um, and these are many different types of images. 
um, I think about 50 or 60 different images, but they can be grouped into three different categories. So the first one is uh, images in protocol buffer format. Um, they have a definition that um, uh, specifies the fields in every image. Uh, images in third party format or raw images. Um, these are images created with an external tool such as TAR if we're checkpointing a temporary file system or uh, uh, IP tables or IP. And uh, the, the third type are memory pages which are, which is essentially the application memory stored in binary format. Um, so images in protocol buffer format are well defined. They are essentially um, small messages that needs to be encrypted. And instead of modifying a CRIO to essentially encrypt every protobuf image that it generates, we um, uh, essentially we are reusing the existing infrastructure, which is um, using a function called pbwrite. So this function essentially serializes the state um, of the protocol buffer message. And then we encrypt the data uh, just before it is written to the output file descriptor. Um, we, gen we load the uh, public key from the uh, TOS certificate. Then we generate a random asymmetric key. We encrypt the symmetric key and store it in, in a new image called Cypher. And then we use the uh, random symmetric key with the Chacha uh, Poly 305 uh, authenticate encryption with associated data to essentially encrypt the content of the protobuf messages. Um, we also append the nonce and authentication tag to every message. Um, uh, the reason we are using this uh, cipher is because um, Essentially, messages are very small, and uh, this is a very efficient way of, um, of encrypting the data. Uh, with external uh, tools or images in third-party format, it's slightly more complicated because essentially we have, um, Creo has a function called CR system that essentially executes this third-party utility, uh, and then it sets the input-output file descriptors to the file descriptor that will save the content or it will read the content. So to enable encryption, we are essentially creating a child process that would intercept um, the communication between the external program uh, and replace the uh, standard input-output file descriptors with a pipe. And then we essentially encrypt and decrypt the data as it is being written to the uh, output file. And um, for memory pages, um, we are using, uh, um, because memory pages are essentially blocks of data with fixed size, it's, more, it's much more efficient to use uh, um, ISXTC uh, and use a single uh, IV in initialization vector for all memory pages instead of adding nodes for every memory page. And it also allows us to essentially modify the encrypted data without decrypting it. Um, because the input and the output have the same size, we, if we want to delete a memory page, we, we don't need to decrypt it. We, we know the, um, the offset of the memory page. And in addition, it has hardware acceleration, so it can be um, um, seven times faster than uh, just using software. Um, so the way um, memory pages are being checkpointed is using something called parasite code, or essentially this is um, position independent code that is injected into the target process and um, it transfers the memory pages into a set of pipes um, and generates a map essentially mapping of the um, memory pages back into their original virtual address. And uh, then it just writes, uh, Creo just writes the memory pages into an output file. And essentially the encryption is very straightforward. We generate the AES, AES keys 
and we um, say store them into the cipher image and we encrypt the data. Um, restoring is slightly more difficult because um, it happens in in a similar way with something called restore context. And um, the way this works is uh, just passing file descriptor, but because the restore context is position independent code, we, we cannot um, decrypt the data. Yeah, um, we cannot link the um, GNU DOS library with this code. So essentially we uh, create a, something similar. We create a child process where um, we use pipes to communicate with the restore context. The restore context requests um, certain offset in the, um, mem in the memory pages. And then um, we read, read the data, decrypt it, and then we use the process VM write EV system call. So essentially using zero copy uh, data transfer from one process to another to restore the memory pages. And we then send back the number of bytes that have been read. Um, and so how do we integrate this with Kubernetes? The main idea is that instead of adding um, external tool or external utility that has to be somehow integrated with the whole system, we are implementing built-in support in the already existing uh, checkpointing mechanism in Kubernetes. So um, essentially um, the way checkpointing works in Kubernetes is the container engine would involve Creo. Uh, Creo will um, um, essentially enter the namespace of the container and then will create um, a checkpoint that contains all the image files. So um, essentially we just need to enable um, the um, encryption capability in Creo. And once the checkpoint is created, we can um, create an OCA container image. And then this OCA image uh, can, can be used to restore the container. So the container, um, the container engine is able to recognize whether um, an OCA image contains a checkpoint or it is a standard OCA image. And if this checkpoint, then it will restore the container instead of trying to start. Um, and I have a few demos. Um, so the first one is um, using a um, large language model. This is actually something that Microsoft are also using uh, in, in production as far as I know. Um, they published a paper called Singularity that describes how they use that. And essentially what we, in, in this example, we are, um, or we are using uh, LLM that uh, answers the question, then we create a checkpoint. Um, the, the container itself um, is using TCP connections. So um, we are um, essentially checkpointing the TCP connection itself, and once the container is restored, it continues from where it was uh, stopped and uh, essentially answers the question. And um, the, the checkpoint itself contains uh, all the uh, process threads, and essentially it allows you to access uh, everything into, um, into the application's memory and modify it. Um, So in this example, you can see all the environment variables that are in, used by the application in the container. And uh, essentially, if there are any um, secrets or uh, passwords, they, they can be extracted. And to enable encryption, essentially, we just need to add um, encrypt option in the configuration file for Creo, and then generate the, um, the public key, uh, public certificate and key. Um, for encryption, we use only the public, uh, uh, the public key from, from the certificate. And for rest when restoring a container, we use only uh, the private key. Um, so this is important for the use case of forensic analysis where we 
um, um, we, we don't need to decrypt the data. Uh, in, essentially, we don't need to upload the private key into our Kubernetes clusters. Um, and um, this is just showing that the restore works and then the, um, the service will continue from where it was stopped. Um, Uh, this another uh, the second demo is with uh, in-memory database. Um, in this case, Redis. So um, Redis. Um, in this case, we are using the uh, Redis benchmark, which would um, essentially create many connections to the Redis database and uh, start uploading data. And we are running this in Kubernetes cluster. Um, we are creating a checkpoint. In this case. By default, the TCP established option is not set, which means if the application is using TCP connection, it will essentially fail and show that you need to add this option in the configuration file. And once this option is added, it will create a checkpoint. Um, and here you can see that um, we can inspect the checkpoint and we can see uh, all the TCP connections and environment variables. Essentially, everything that the checkpoint um, of the application contains. And uh, to, en to enable encryption, it's essentially the same thing. We just need to uh, add the encrypt option in the configuration file for Creo. So it doesn't require any changes to uh, the existing workflow for container checkpointing. And uh, the last case, uh, the last example is with video streaming. So in this case, um, we have a container in, running in Kubernetes cluster called Restreamer that essentially uh, streams, uh, creates live stream. And in this case, it has a counter to see um, um, the progress. And uh, we can essentially create a checkpoint of the, of the container and then convert this checkpoint into a um, container image. Then this container image has an annotation that includes the container name. This annotation is then used by the um, container engine to identify that this is uh, a checkpoint. And um, in this case, uh, we have a local registry in the Kubernetes cluster that um, we can then uh, upload this container image, and um, then we can modify the um, YAML file for the, um, for the Kubernetes pod to use the checkpoint instead of the original base image. Um, Builder is the tool that, in this case, we use to uh, build the container image to upload it to the registry. And, um, yeah, to, for, for encryption to, to be enabled, we just need to add the um, um, uh, encrypt option for Creo. And in this case, we're just replacing the base image with the checkpoint image. Um, in this case, we are also closing the TCP connections because there is some delay between stopping and restarting. And um, once we click on the retry button, then it will try to reconnect to the server and resume from the point when the checkpoint was created. Um, so we also did some performance evaluation on how this um, is different from uh, alternative methods or essentially how um, providing built-in support in Creo um, differs from um, using an external tool to encrypt the checkpoint. And there are two main types of workloads, um, compute intensive and memory intensive. So compute intensive are um, applications that create many threads or um, many processes that run in container. And in this case, Creo will create um, many small files and just opening and uh, closing these files uh, creates a lot of overhead for external tools. And then memory intensive applications usually have a small number of images, um, but have very large size. 
So in this case, um, memory pages will be the main component of the checkpoint. And uh, we compared, uh, we use um, OpenSL, PG, and H. Um, and we integrated this with the, um, something called action script. So this is uh, essentially a shell script that run, runs in the post dump hook. So once the checkpoint is created, just before uh, Creo finishes, it will execute this shell script. And essentially what it does is just um, it essentially encrypting all the files in the checkpoint directory. And so um, this is, and these are the evaluation results. On the left, you can see um, a comparison of the checkpoint time. So uh, for compute intensive application, and it could be uh, up to two orders of magnitude faster than using an external tool, mainly because um, you are avoiding the overhead of re, uh, opening and closing many files. We're essentially encrypting the data just before it is written to disk. It also reduces the um, storage requirements since we don't really need additional storage to uh, save the checkpoint, uh, to encrypt the checkpoint. And on the right uh, is shown the uh, encryption throughput or essentially um, um, it, it takes less time to uh, encrypt the data mainly because um, we don't have to open and close uh, many files. Essentially, we're um, encrypting the data just before it is written to disk. And um, thank, you, thank you for listening. And uh, as a summary, uh, we are um, adding built-in support for checkpoint encryption in Creo. It provides uh, reduced encryption overhead, and it's seamless to integrate with existing container platforms and Kubernetes. And if you can also go on GitHub and uh, see the project. Thank you. I'm happy. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, uh, I mean, there are multiple different uh, companies using Checkpoint Restore. Um, it's becoming more popular now with uh, GPU checkpointing. NVIDIA, for example, recently released a tool that allows to checkpoint the GPU state with Creo. Um, Microsoft are using this internally with uh, their Singularity system. And uh, Google with have integration with Borg. Um, there, there was also a talk at KubeCon, um, I think back in November last year, uh, that, uh, uh, from Tencent. So Tencent are also using GPU checkpointing. And the main thing is, um, I mean, there are many different companies using it, but uh, the main benefits are, um, for example, preemptive scheduling, where you can, um, instead of terminating a, a pod or container, you can create a checkpoint and then resume the application from where it was. I mean, scaling is a different problem. Um, so yeah, there, there are different use cases in general. Um, I, I, I haven't experimented with scaling, but I know that there are some research. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other use case is application startup. It's very popular with Java applications because the Java applications take a long time to initialize and to start. So uh, the Java community has integrated Creo with um, a, a project called Crack or Coordinated Checkpoint Restore. Um, and essentially it um, creates a checkpoint just after Java has initialized the Java runtime. And then restoring from the checkpoint is faster than initializing the state. Yeah. Well, they they use Firecracker, so Firecracker has uh, also a checkpointing mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, TCP connections are quite interesting. Um, the way it works is uh, there is um, an option in the kernel called TCP repair that allows you to essentially um, modify or modify the state of of, of the TCP socket. 
So um, essentially, we save uh, any data that has been received but hasn't been read from the application. And then we restore the TCP sockets and restore their state. And then once the application is resumed, it can just continue as this. The main challenge is when the IP address changes. So for example, if you migrate an application from one node to another, um, the client wouldn't know that the IP address will change. So the, the client will continue sending packets to the destination node. And we currently have a Google Summer Code project working on this. But essentially, you can use a load balancer to um, keep track of the new IP address and then redirect the TCP packets. Oh, um, it depends on the state. So it depends how much state is uh, the application has. So um, you know, if you use something like, uh, there's, there's a technique called post-copy migration or lazy migration. It's essentially just copying the CPU state of the application and then resuming immediately. And with this, the downtime is very small, mainly because you're transferring just a few kilobytes or megabyte data. And uh, then all memory pages are transferred on demand. So we use a mechanism called user fault FD. So every time when the application tries to access some memory page, this memory page is transferred. Thanks. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you. For listening.